entrepreneurs to couch welcome to today's show in today's show we have decided to invite chieza shonyua chieza shonyua is a practicing lawyer she has got an llb law degree she also has got a master's degree in corporate or commercial law today we have decided we need to bring her onto the show to make sure that our business people and entrepreneurs do benefit from a legal point of view chieza welcome to the program Thank you so much for having me. Chiedza, we are happy to invite you and to have you on, sh on the show today because uh, we have talked to a number of entrepreneurs and we've always discussed about partnerships, but not from a legal point of view. Now we thought it would be best if we can bring in a person who has got a legal background such that you help us in terms of how best we can go about drafting and getting involved in legally binding uh, agreements and contracts okay okay my first question chiedza then is uh what is a partnership agreement why should business people and entrepreneurs be involved in signing legally binding partnership agreements okay, that's an excellent question um a partnership agreement take it as if it's a contract it's not as if it's actually a contract between people who want to enter into a partnership. So let's say you have individuals who decide to run a business and not as the sole owners, but together. So you have different type of people who actually own a share in the business. And before they proceed with the business, they actually enter into a contract. A contract which stipulates terms, obligations, uh, between the parties, including even profit sharing uh, between or amongst the parties involved. Mm. How many types of partnerships are there? Um, there are a few different types of partnerships, but I'm going to narrow it down to Zimbabwe. Called, because now in Zimbabwe, you can have a partnership between individuals, like human beings, between individuals, or you can have a partnership that is including or between entities, between companies. So you have some partnership agreements where people don't end up forming uh, a company or they don't run the partnership under a company. So in that instance, you have people who are personally liable for any debt or obligations that arise in the partnership. So that's one form of a partnership. Then you can also have another form of a partnership where um, the partnership is run under the bracket of a company, a private limited company. So that partnership has the benefit of having the individuals not liable, but you have the company as being liable. So it's, it's almost, almost one and the same, but it's just different in terms of liability or it's different in terms of who is part of that uh, partnership, whether they're individuals or whether you have entities involved in the partnership. What then determines whether one makes a decision to get into a partnership as a company or as an individual? Okay. Uh, before, we, before even a person decides whether or not uh, they can get into a partnership as a group of people or as a company, um, the question is how does the person want to run their business? Uh, you can wake up today and say, I want to start my tobacco business, for example. And you are the one who's solely responsible from the beginning to the end of that business. So people call you a sole proprietor. So there's no talk of a partnership there. But now where you want to start a business, but you realize that you want to hope in other individuals, other people. Um, who actually strengthen certain aspects of the business, it means there are going to be two or more people who have an ownership share in the business. Already then you're looking more or less to a partner. And now when we talk about running through the gaze of having it under a company, now you have to go through the hurdles of forming a company, uh, also following the obligations and the rules that are also involved in forming a company. Because to form a company, there are certain steps that you have to follow. 
you need directors, at least two directors. There are certain things that even the company acts stipulates and states that you have to have or you have to follow. So that might be a bit more strenuous for other people to run their partnership through a company. So other people will just opt to do just simply the partnership agreement without having to register the company and go through the hurdles that are involved in actually running a private limited company. So it depends. It's, it depends with the individuals. Uh, what you can or cannot do, what you're willing to do, uh, what will be more strenuous to do, um, and, and stuff like that. It just depends. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It just depends on the type of partnership involved. Hmm. Now that uh, one is about or is getting involved in the drawing up of the partnership uh, agreement or contract, is there any particular specific information that should be contained in these partnership contracts for them to be legally binding and for them to be enforceable? Okay. Um, ordinarily, we, we actually push for people to enter into the partnership agreements at the very start of the, of the professional relationship. And I can't say all the terms <laughs> today. I can't. It will take up the whole show. Mm -hmm. um, but just to be a bit uh, clear on a few terms, Ordinarily, a partnership agreement, you have to stake the parties involved. You have to. So it means the information of the individuals, their IDs, their addresses, which we call the domicilium, where they want to be served with the documents or whatever it is. And then you have another term of the agreement where it relates to profit sharing, because I believe this is one of the important terms of the agreement. How are you going to share the profits? Yes, you have roped in different people, but there's going to come a time where it's business. You have to share the money. How are you going to share it? And also, uh, another important term uh, between, the, between the parties is to state the obligations or responsibility that each partner has towards the business. Because now, if you have a partnership agreement, it, it has to be clear in terms of what is expected of the partners, what they're expected to do, the timelines, um, how they're going to share the profits, their obligations. So simply the first thing I would say is it's important for the partners to state their intentions, what they want the agreement to state. Don't think about it and not put it in the agreement. Don't assume a term and not put it in the agreement. If you're going to be sharing profits, 50, 20, 30% amongst the individuals involved, it has to be clear in the contract. If you intend to say the first uh, profit that the business realizes goes back into the business, it has to also be clear. So the first thing for any partnership agreement is for the intentions of the parties to be captured in that agreement. And all those questions, the what if questions, what if one partner dies? What if the other partner cannot fulfill an obligation? What if A, what if B? All those what if scenarios have to be covered by the agreement. But now to say are the specific terms, the partnerships agreement are going to be different. You have a partnership agreement in terms of mining. You have another partnership agreement that can arise uh, through, let's say, agriculture, it involves agricultural farming, those agreements cannot be the same. They are always different and are specific to the nature of the relationship uh, that the parties have or the nature of the business. So you can't have a one-size-fits-all partnership across the board. But the important thing is, does the agreement reflect the intentions of the parties? If it does, excellent then you just have to sign it and it's binding. Uh, all the parties that sign, it's binding. And another term of uh, the agreement that's necessary is to state whether or not the agreement um, is going to go through the court system or it's going to go through arbitration. 
How are you going to resolve disputes that may arise? It's also necessary to look beyond that. Because unfortunately, people, when they start business, everyone is happy. Everyone is on board. They don't specify terms. And they leave those areas blank. And those are the areas that will actually cause problems in the future. Hmm. Chiedza, I've known a lot of business people who have entered into verbal uh, agreements. How valid and legally enforceable are verbal partnership agreements? Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're right. Those are the, there are quite a number of verbal agreements that people enter into because either they know the other party or their family members or something like that. So they don't bother themselves to actually put the relationship down in writing. A verbal agreement is still, is still an agreement. It is still binding. It is enforceable, a verbal agreement. The only challenge that you will have is that where a dispute then arises, we hope a dispute doesn't arise, but in the event that it arises, it's going to be very difficult to prove uh, your case. If you're saying, for example, let's take uh, profit sharing. You believe that um, one of the partners believes that they should get 60% and they believe that this was the agreement verbally. But there's nothing in writing. It's not clear. It means you end up having to waste your time. You, have, you end up having to use more money to go to court to prove your case to actually prove that these were the terms and they're verbal. So it means that between the parties, if they're two part partners, it means that it's a he said, she said scenario. You're going bef before a judge, you have to verbally prove or somewhat try to prove the agreement, the verbal agreement, that the party is denying the same and all you have is just a headache. It's difficult to prove because it's more simple to just say, this is the agreement. This is black and white. This is what's written on that agreement. And once you do that, it's very, very easy to just go by the agreement. Verbal agreements, problematic in terms of proving. But they are valid though. But proving them, yeah, might be a headache actually. Mm. A lot of people may get into these partnerships without foreseeing some challenges that may come along the way. If, yes. people, if people have a, a running partnership contract and then some other circumstances arise later, is it possible to alter and, and or amend the initial partnership contract? Uh, the advantage of having a partnership agreement in writing is to make life easier for the people involved in that business or that partnership. It has to make life easier. So a good partnership agreement has to make life easier. And of course, things change. Um, the agreement, there might be terms and obligations that may arise that uh, the parties cannot fulfill based on different circumstances. So now if you have an agreement, I believe there's a, there's a question that you asked me about terms of agreement uh, that are actually very essential. There's a term in, an, in a written agreement, which can be put in an agreement, which I would want people to actually place in the, in the agreement, which says that if ever you want to alter or change the written agreement, vary the terms of that written agreement. The doors, the variation has to be done in writing and it has to be signed by the parties involved. So now you have a situation where it allows you to change terms uh, of the original, if I can call it that, agreement. But then it also then stipulates, if you put the variation clause, it also stipulates that if you are to change the terms of that relationship, you have to do it in right thing, and it has to be signed by the parties involved. Because you can have a scenario where circumstances change and an agreement shouldn't kill the parties who entered into the agreement. That's not the purpose of the agreement. It's to just make the relationship smooth. 
So now if you have a written agreement and you don't put the variation clause, it means that it can be valid by a verbal agreement. So you end up now with the same situation we were talking about, where you have your clear terms, but you have another partner now saying, no, we varied these terms. These are no longer the terms that apply. They've been overtaken by events. And we now have a verbal agreement. Because you haven't put the variation clause to say, if you are to vary anything, then that variation has to be done in writing and signed by the parties. So yes, to answer the question, you can vary the agreement as much as you want. But at least you have to put a safeguard, a safety net, to say how are you going to vary that agreement so that at least everything is black and white and everything is just regulated clear. Yes. Hmm. Disputes in partnership contracts or agreements may always arise. I know you have partly talked about arbitration and or the courts. Just briefly, how do people who are involved in partnership contracts resolve their disputes? Okay. Um, the first thing is when parties enter into an agreement, everyone, as I stated before, everyone is happy. Everyone is on board. Uh, people are spelling out what they want from the partnership. Uh, they're stipulating their intentions, their obligations, and everything is running smoothly. It is at that time where parties have to actually see how they want to resolve their own dispute. And some contracts will say that if uh, there is a default on the part of one of the partners, then they can tell their partner who's in default to rectify the breach uh, within a specific number of days. Some contracts will say 14 days, some will say 21 days, depending on the nature of the contract. So that's the first a step in terms of uh, trying to trying to resolve a dispute where you put the person who's in default on terms so that they resolve it rather than just jumping to court. And then even further, some agreements can even say that parties are called to a meeting. If this is not resolved, parties should come together for a meeting and find how best to resolve the dispute that may arise. And then now you have a situation where depending on the nature of the agreement. Some parties can realize that the, the, the nature of the agreement is a bit more complicated or more complex, and they don't want it to be handled by a judge because they believe that maybe the terms, usually with mining agreements, they put an arbitration clause in the agreement. They say if a dispute arises, they go through step one where they tell the defaulting party to rectify the breach, they do step two to call the parties together and see if they cannot resolve the dispute amongst themselves. Step three, they say, you know what? And they, they are stipulated number of days here. It's not an open, uh, it's not an open close where you can go for a year or two years trying to convince someone. Then step three may say, okay, um, we want our dispute to be resolved, if ever a dispute arises, to be resolved by an arbitrator. And then it has to even go further. It can, because it's, it's an agreement. You can even go further to actually say what you want the arbitrator to deal with or the qualifications of the arbitrator. Some, they say we want an arbitrator with five years experience in commercial uh, litigation. Some would say that we want an arbitrator with a background uh, in terms of mining. So you can choose the arbitrator that you want by just specific, specifying the attributes that you would want because you believe such a person would be best suited to handle the dispute. Or you can just simply say uh, the, any court in, in Zimbabwe, for example, uh, can handle a dispute that may arise between the parties. You can leave it for the court to decide. But ordinarily, where people enter into this agreement, it is more suit best to actually settle rather than to fight in court. Because fighting in court is not good for business. A partnership agreement is good for business. It means that you avoid the legalities of having to go to court. Because court is consuming. It's our job, yes, for us, it will be business, but 
for people who are in there to do other things which are not related to litigation, it will take time. It will take time. And you don't want to be stuck in such a situation. So you can put a clause to say how best you want uh, your dispute to be dealt with and not leave a judge to give a final decision on whatever uh, dispute that may arise between the parties. Hmm. As an entrepreneur and a business person, I happen to find another interested party who is not necessarily staying in the very same country where I am staying. Is it possible to consummate a legally binding partnership contract with somebody who is not staying in the very same country where a business person may be staying? No, indeed. Um, fortunately, because of technology, the world has become small, so to speak. And now you can have an agreement with someone from Botswana uh, and you're from Zimbabwe, or you can have someone from Australia having an agreement with someone in New Zealand. Uh, there's nothing that stops the parties from having an agreement or entering into an illegally binding agreement. The only difference is that now you have to anticipate if a dispute then arises, which court will deal with the matter, which arbitrator will deal with the matter. For example, if you get into an agreement with uh, an entity or someone who is in Botswana, uh, then you also have to specify that we would want the court of Botswana or the court of Zimbabwe to deal with the issue that may arise between the parties. You give the court jurisdiction. Because now courts can only uh, take on matters that they have jurisdiction over. And then it becomes an issue of, let us look at the agreement. What does the agreement say? Where was the agreement signed? And you can make it easy for, for, the, for, for, for future sakes and actually make it so clear to say, this is the jurisdiction, this is the country or the courts that are going to deal with the matter if the parties ever have a dispute. But there's nothing that should stop people from actually um, entering into legally binding agreements. The only thing is, besides the issue of having a dispute that may arise, the terms of the agreement now have to be very specific in terms of catering to the nature of the parties. The address, the domicilium is now very important to say, okay, if we are going to send documents or send whatever, which address are we going to use in the respective country? That has to be clear. And now it also has to be clear to say, okay, fine. If there's an issue of profit sharing, who is going to be paid? How are they going to be paid? In which account are they going to be paid? Because now, knowing the laws of Zimbabwe in terms of payment, which is another topic for another day, but in terms of um, making payments between uh, different countries, it's more difficult now. So now the agreement has to cater to those instances, to those issues that relate to that type of agreement. Hmm. As a follow-up question, now that parties have consummated or they've come up with a partnership contract and one of the partners happens not to be staying in the very country where an operation is best, in the event that there are other things that may need to be done and the person cannot be there physically, does it need to be included or does it also apply that the other person can appoint either a proxy or find a representative who can represent him whilst he's away? Yes, very much so. Um, since now, uh, as you had indicated, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to do business. Uh, with someone who's not in the exact same country uh, as you're in. But in the event that a person needs someone to actually oversee the project or the business or be involved in the nitty gritties of, um, of the project, then you, have, um, you can actually have someone to represent you by power of attorney. All you need to do is draft a power of attorney or have your lawyer draft a power of attorney or even a special power of attorney. And they draft that document for you. You sign, 
you appoint someone and you actually have to state uh, the mandate that you're giving them. Because every power of attorney has uh, a mandate. Every person who's given a power of attorney has a mandate. And they can only act within the mandate that they have been given. Some people with power of attorney can sign documents as if uh, it's the person who actually gave them the power of attorney. And even if they go to court, the court doesn't see them. They see the person who has given them the power of attorney. So they are acting as agents. And the person who has given them power of attorney is the principal. So whatever it is that they do within the limits of the mandate that they've been given is valid. And you can actually have a person representing you in the specific country that you want, a person that you have appointed, so that they can even attend meetings, they can sign documents, they can collect, receive, they can act as if they are you. A specific, like the, as if when they walk into the room, people will know that no, it's the person, is the principal that has walked into the room because they are walking under the authority that they have been given. So you can definitely have that. And even if legal disputes uh, arise, they still go to court on behalf of the principal and they attend uh, whichever hearings are necessary uh, on behalf of uh, the principal and you don't have to actually uh, leave your country or fly out to go to wherever the project or, uh, is, or the business is operating for. Hmm. Chiesa, we are very grateful for you coming onto the platform. Maybe I would want you to take this opportunity to talk to our viewers who are mostly business people in terms of uh, partnerships, but not only that legal advice. Is there any particular uh, information that you may want to share with uh, uh, partners, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs who may be watching our show? <clears throat> Um, what I can say, uh, without taking much of your much of your time, is that uh, when a person who is starting a business is told or advised to enter into an agreement, and hopefully they use a legal person to draft the agreement, because then at least the legal person has knowledge to know uh, which loopholes to avoid, which terms to include and how best to draft the agreement for purposes of the, of the partnership or the business. But now, ordinarily, when people are starting out, they're starting out, they don't have the capital uh, to actually then say, oh, fine, let me find a legal person. They just then do the verbal agreements or they do their own agreements, they go on Google, they copy-paste an agreement, which I specifically say, no partnership is the same. So you can't have a one size fits all and you can't uh, foresee certain loopholes and you can't foresee certain terms. So even if it seems expensive at the time to engage someone to actually assist, it saves you more money uh, and it saves you more time to put everything in writing, black and white, to sign it because that is business. That is good business. And because for us, ordinarily we have people that we help, but they come at the last hour when everything is already messed up. And now what they want is someone to go to court with them. And they have this agreement and now you have to ask, okay, fine, how do you prove this term? When did you agree to this? And it's, it's a lot of work. And now you have to be looking at emails, uh, and looking at WhatsApp messages, trying to just establish that there was an agreement between the party. And sometimes people are so excited when an opportunity comes, so excited that they would rather part ways with their money and just say, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I have to take it now. I'm parting ways with my money. Uh, you know, tomorrow this opportunity might not come. And then you do not enter into an agreement. Not everyone is genuine. You can find yourself in a situation where you've given a person money and the person has disappeared. You don't have the address, you don't have anything in writing, you have nothing, and you have already lost money because you're trying to skip steps. So now, a step not to skip is at least have someone look over the agreement and the arrangements if you're going to enter into a partnership. 
I know some people will say, no, we go to church together. We pray together. Uh, I trust this person so much. It's still good business to put things in writing because you don't want a situation where you regret. You sit down and say, if only I had taken the time, if only I had needed someone to actually assist me. So now the advice I can give is entrepreneurs, yes, be excited to have people starting their own businesses, being entrepreneurs. It's something that's actually admirable. But even in doing that, there are better ways within which you can do it. And the advice that I'll give you is don't skip the step. Have, have an agreement in place. Uh, do background checks. If you can't do background checks, you have a lawyer do that for you because then at least that's due diligence. They will carry out due diligence. They will see if a person has the assets because in any partnership agreement, I'm going to be specific in partnership agreements, you have um, uh, an, a situation where a person says, I'm going to bring in uh, the business, let's say five vehicles. Uh, so you bring in, let's say it's a farming agreement. It relates to farming. You bring in the land. Sometimes they don't even have the land. And, or they don't even have the asset that they say they have. Or even then, even if the partnership then buys assets, you find someone at the end if there's no agreement saying, ah, no, I have to take all the assets because I bought in more. You can just simply bring in the labor, but the labor will be very essential. Let's say you are the one who's saying, I will bring in the labor in the relationship and others are bringing in the capital. But you also have to safeguard that um, your interest and you have to safeguard them by entering into an agreement where you say, even if you bring the labor, what are you going to get out of the business? Because if you don't specify that, uh, unfortunately, you might end up crying, which we don't want. Partnerships agreements, they're good. Uh, you avoid having to go to court. In as much as I spoke about court arbitration, you avoid all those hurdles. You avoid the, 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 the misfortunes of having to spend your time in court trying to prove your case because you simply took the time to put everything in black and white and to sign. I think that's, that's the advice I can give uh, entrepreneurs out there. Chedza, we are very grateful for your own information. A lot of entrepreneurs and business people have had their fingers bent. We normally are, as you have rightly said, we normally are very excited. Sometimes we are too impatient to wait and even go and consult our lawyers. Uh, kids, I would want to take this opportunity to say I'm very grateful. Going forward, we are going to be inviting you onto the platform to talk about more legal issues, more legal loopholes that we can uh, avoid. We are going to be talking about contracts. You have mentioned the issue to do with the due diligence. Uh, in my own experience, and I believe a lot of uh, business people, SMEs mostly, they do not actually engage lawyers. And we only rush to lawyers when we are in trouble. And as you have rightly said, some of the problems can be avoided if we could have uh, consulted our lawyers uh, earlier on. So to yeah. our viewers across the globe, we have been talking to Chia Dashonua. She is a legal expert. She is a lawyer. But the most important thing is uh, she has got a master's degree in commercial law. We are going to be having her onto the platform more often to make sure that besides running our businesses, we are legally covered. So may you continue subscribing and watch out for our next shows. Chieza, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.